Hey guys, it's God Bars here, the self-proclaimed hip-hop historian, and this is the 92nd episode of my series where I grab a vinyl from my collection, talk about why I love it, what influence it had, and what its place is in the grand scheme of hip-hop. So while I was initially going to talk about this one in my last 90s group, I talked about The Cold Vein a little while ago, and my very first video was Fantastic Damage, so it made a little more sense to save it. I did a lot of deliberation on trying to decide what the most critically acclaimed and beloved underground hip-hop album was from the 90s, which I know is a bit of an oxymoron. When we say underground for acts of this era, it means more that at the time they were relatively unknown, but a lot of them will gain a status over the years that makes it kind of hard to call them underground in retrospect. But through my research of trying to see what most commonly gets called the best underground hip-hop album in the 90s, it does seem like Company Flow's seminal debut gets that title fairly often. Some of the other albums I was considering against Fun Crusher were projects that also gained a cult status and following over time, like Dr. Octagonicologist, The Dino Spectrum, the first volume of Lyricist Lounge, Hieroglyphics debut, Peanut Butter Wolf's My Vinyl Weighs a Ton, and even Operation Doomsday, which I only really decided against because I've already done multiple Doom projects. I suppose a better term might be alternative hip-hop, because this album is pretty easily the most experimental and potentially difficult out of the whole group, probably even out of anything I've covered so far, period. There were some forward-thinking and risky hip-hop acts floating around in the 90s, but content and style-wise, Company Flow makes most of them look like kids' bop. It isn't like it's a competition to see who can be the edgiest and most different for the sake of it, but I see the word underground used constantly for rappers who just aren't. For example, I see it all the time with opium fans calling pretty much anyone who's less famous than Playboy Cardi an underground rapper. When it'll be someone who's been making music for four months, has two songs, and 20 million streams each. Fun Crusher is challenging because it wanted to push the genre forward while still maintaining a clear respect and reverence for the pioneers that came before them. And that difficulty doesn't come from a lack of quality or creativity. Coke Flow is just so experimental and forward thinking. Really, the only people I can think of who were doing anything remotely as outside the box as them at that time were some of the acts coming out of the underground West Coast label Anticon, namely Cloud Dead. LP actually had a beef with Soul, one of my favorite Anticon artists who was a member of Deep Puddle Dynamics, alongside Slug and Ant of Atmosphere, amongst others. You kind of have to dig to find their diss tracks to each other. I don't believe they're on streaming services and it's kind of hard to piece together the full story, but it's a shame they didn't get along because I always thought Coflo and Anticon would be such a dope and fitting collaboration. Anyway, Company Flow ended up being one of those endeavors that basically ended before it really got started, with the only bright side being the members splitting up, allowed LP to branch out and develop his impressive solo career and production discography. Besides Al, who rapped and of course did production, Coke Flow included the killer MC Big Just and the talented DJ Mr. Len. Not to be confused with Mr. Lith, who was another dope artist that was under that Def Jux umbrella LP created. While I've talked at length about El Producto and his illustrious career, his partner in rhyme Big Just was just as lyrically talented and has plenty of quality solo material to offer as well. If you're only familiar with LP through his more recent work with Run the Jewels, you'll notice a drastic change when you check out his dense head-spinning verses, especially on Fun Crusher. Even though his solo debut was also more left field than the Run the Jewels stuff, and he still has his witty, reference-heavy pen, the flows on that album are for the most part a bit slower and easier to swallow than this one, though they're still marginally harder to digest than the Run the Jewels albums. While I would never say L didn't progress and evolve as an MC, producer, and overall artist, there are an amount of people who prefer the company flow output to his recent stuff. I think most fans enjoy both because they specialize in different sounds and energies and that's completely intentional. L isn't being less lyrically coded or technically complex because he's losing the ability or becoming lazy, it just isn't really the type of music he goes for with Killer Mike. I personally hugely enjoy both eras, but I can totally understand people who prefer the insane structures of his old verses because I've heard a pretty good amount of hip-hop in my lifetime, and there hasn't been an MC before or after Company Flow that raps or writes how L did in those days, at least not on my radar. And remember, that's just one side of him. He also makes almost all the beats on here, outside of one by Just and a few by Len. 
and most of the time these instrumentals are just as off kilter and alien as the flows, at times maybe even more so. There's a story I've heard about Common being given one of these instrumentals to rap over at a radio station, and he understandably got kinda stumped because LP made these beats with challenging people in mind. It isn't just challenging due to being hip-hop's equivalent of Captain Beefheart, it also has a very purposeful, dark, and twisted aesthetic. Like the sample that starts the entire album off is this very disturbing snippet of a lady telling some children about how they should tell their parents if someone tries to touch them in the wrong places, fittingly titled Bad Touch Example. It's these bizarre, unexplained moments that to me come off as more unsettling and disconcerting than the type of kind of edgy horrorcore rap guys like Eminem and Tyler the Creator would later attempt. Not that I don't enjoy those projects, they have their place and they both did that style well, I just find Fun Crusher Plus a lot more ominous. Big Jess comes in right after the intro with a killer verse that shows right away that deciding the best of the two MCs isn't easy. He breaks down the door with... Your eyes get blind like Tupac getting shot in the lobby. Most MC styles is robbery of my freestyles is a hobby. I pick apart monkey brains and spread disease through hot zones. My cameos on promos seem strange like someone's not home. One of LP's top verses comes on 8 Steps to Perfection, which is probably my favorite company flow song overall next to end to end burners. It also has a really cool flip of Telephone Line by ELO, which serves as the second movement for the beat where LP comes in with Check It and I Inflict It, Quadra 950 Lungs Misty, Calling Me Maximilian Cause I'm That Crazy Robot, Teetering on the Edge of Outer Space, Spitting Buckshots Till Black Holes Surround Me, You Found Me. As far as I'm concerned, I got your ashes in an urn. Big up, the temperamental holds none. Bard kid, what's your confunction? Tracks is tight, dusty, drinking water out the well of life, and I'ma piss it back, rusty. The one other moment I really have to mention here is LP's gut-wrenching solo track about trauma from witnessing abuse, Last Good Sleep. I'm not really gonna delve into the specifics when it comes to the lyrics of this song because I'd be doing it a disservice. All I can say is it's a stomach-turning tale of L witnessing his mother's physical abuse as a child and the guilt and self-hate that comes from witnessing an ongoing traumatic event like that, especially as a helpless kid. He builds the hook around an interpolation of the Cool G rap song, Streets of New York, specifically the lines where he says, At night I cover my ears in tears, the man downstairs must have drank too many beers. Now every night of his life he beats his wife. All of the verses in this song are contenders for some of the best poetry in hip-hop for me, especially the first one. I really suggest checking that song out at the very least if you enjoy, or at least appreciate more morbid hip-hop like Immortal Techniques Dance with the Devil or The Roots The Return to Innocence Lost, and I definitely recommend reading along with the lyrics on this one. There's only three features on here, but they're insanely talented underground MCs you need to do yourself a favor and check out if you haven't. These being BMS, J Treads, and Breeze Bruin of Juggernauts, and Breeze actually played the lead character in Prince Paul's cinematic concept album Prince Among Thieves, which is another essential must listen as it's really the Good Kid Mad City before Good Kid Mad City. Though take that with a grain of salt, because obviously these are both amazing albums that do offer different experiences. Fun Crusher has way too many classic and innovative moments to mention, so I'm gonna have to get to my three favorite songs, which is subject to change over time with how much I love every track. But for now at least, my top three would have to be 8 Steps to Perfection, Last Good Sleep, and The Fire in Which You Burn. The tracks that just missed the cut would have to be Collude slash Intrude, Blind, Legends, Loon TNS, Population Control, 89.9 Detrimental, Tragedy of War in Three Parts, Crazy Kings, and Info Kill 2. Thank you for watching my 90 second video. Next time we're going to actually discuss one of the most impactful and aggressive groups in 90s hardcore hip hop. So tune in to see what classic I'm talking about. And if you enjoyed, be sure to like, subscribe, and let me know what your favorite songs are off of Koklo's debut that rocked the underground. Don't forget to have a great day, and I'll see you next time, okay? Alright. Thank <laughs> you.